Come on. So as I've somehow managed to become the unofficial creepy clown movie YouTuber, somehow, I decided, you know what, let's shake things up when it comes to these creepy looking clown movies. We need some originality around here. Things are starting to get a little old and stale, and quite frankly, they're starting to give off a foul odour. And no, it's not me, I checked. <laughs> well how could you add a twist on something so simple as a killer clown movie? Man turning into a clown? Well we've already had that. Clown coming back from the dead for revenge. Yep, already been done. Whatever in the holy hell that Art the Clown is, we've had that too. Twice. So I present to you, Clown in a Box. Yeah, that's the best I could do, sorry. The movie begins with an old man metal detecting in a field and coming across a box buried within the ground. A jack in the box. And apparently, this thing is what nightmares are made of. And if I were him, I'd put that right back in the ground where I found it, and probably a few extra feet deep just to be safe. Once back at home, the little clown retracts back into the box, grabbing the attention of the man's wife, causing her to come over and investigate. A large clawed creature begins to emerge from the box, and the next thing that we know, the old man finds his wife's corpse being dragged into the box by this clawed creature. I would make a joke about her having a large box, but uh, that's just rude. Twelve years pass since the large boxed clown incident, and we're introduced to the main character named Casey, an American who's moved to England and is starting a job in a museum. He meets his co-worker Lisa, and the pair begin to clean out an old storeroom. While in there having a look around, they come across the same box from 12 years ago. The locking mechanism isn't exactly what I'd describe as secure, as it appears you only need to move the letters in the correct order to unlock it. However, after only moving one of the letters, they all rearrange themselves to spell out the word Jack. You know, just in case she didn't know what was inside this thing. Casey starts turning the handle that is now somehow a completely different colour to the questionable quality CGI one that we'd literally just seen a matter of seconds ago, before the pair get jump scared by Jack, who is no longer in the box. Later that night, a couple of burglars break into the museum because apparently they're avid collectors of World War One memorabilia, because that's all we ever get to see in regards to the history of this history museum. One of them comes across Jack, and begins to act as if he isn't in a room completely alone, and begins to insult the non-sentient piece of plastic, because f*** that doll. Well apparently he is sentient, or there just happens to be a rather unfortunate gust of wind, as the box then slams shut on the man's fingers. Followed by the box opening once more, and the hand that got all grabby with the grandma 12 years ago begins to emerge. After calling out for his friend and getting no response, his burglar buddy goes to look for him, but ends up coming across this instead. Apparently Jack's been eating his vegetables, or old ladies, as he's now grown up and ready for a second serving of man. The burglar has the bright idea to hide under a table from the terrifying demonic looking creature he just encountered, because hide and seek never really was his strong suit. But that's no problem for Jack, as he punches through the top of the table and kills the man. Back with Casey and Lisa, they're out getting dinner after work, and we learn that apparently Lisa is quite the ventriloquist, as she manages to say a whole sentence without moving her lips. I have to tell. <laughs> I have to tell. <laughs> We also learn that Casey has been suffering from insomnia, but the movie's doing that whole mysterious cool guy thing where it doesn't actually let you know what his deal is. Until it immediately lets you know what his deal is, as we see in the very next scene, he's dreaming about a woman being followed by someone with a knife as she desperately tries to call Casey for help. Because the police were too busy to take her call or something. I don't know. If you're moving to England to escape knife crime, then boy have I got some bad news for you. The next day, Casey discovers that the museum has been broken into the night before, which is rather unlucky for him, considering that this is his literal second day on the job, and he's visited by a man to come and check the authenticity of this box, because apparently there's a few people out there who deal in the fine arts of boxes and their many unique forms. He explains to Casey that some boxologists out there believe that the original Jack in the Boxes were in fact not children's toys, but a tool created in France to contain demons. So we're dealing with a French demon then. Just try throwing a baguette at it or something. Later that day, Casey is having, uh, I don't know, a midday sleeping session or something, as a visitor enters the museum and the Jack in the Box begins to play its tune. She enters the same room as it, and for some reason the lights turn off, because I guess the clown knows where the fuse box is or something. And we then get our first real look at the menacing looking French demon clown as it tears open the woman's throat. 
We then see that the number on the box changes from a 2 to a 3, because apparently this thing's got its own built-in Call of Duty styled leaderboard. The next day while on the way to work, Casey sees a missing persons poster from the woman who just found herself as Jack's third killstreak, and the movie proceeds to show us a flashback sequence as if we hadn't already just watched that exact same sequence play out. My memory may not be great, but I'm pretty sure that I can remember that scene from five minutes ago, where Mr. French Clown emerged from his unusually large box to unlife a woman. Casey, who is apparently off limits with this box who happens to kill everybody except him, decides to try and find out more information about his demonic French friend, and he learns that once the box has been opened, the Jack's goal is to kill six people before returning to the box, because Seven is just a crowd. He's doing this as Mini Jack is staring off into the distance minding his own business, before he then decides to look directly at Casey instead. That's fine, I didn't want to sleep tonight anyway. Casey leaves for the weekend, for some reason without burning this tiny little clown who's clearly never been told that it's rude to stare. Leaving the clown and the cleaning lady in the same building alone, she comes across the box and is given the side eye by Jack, causing her to insult the doll, because apparently people around these parts have an incredibly strong disliking for inanimate objects. Deeply offended by her horrible remarks, the box disappears as she looks away, and after she notices that it's gone, she attempts to make a run for it with her little squirt bottle in hand, because apparently she takes her job as a cleaning lady very seriously. She's confronted by the box on the stairs, and after trying to make her way past, she's made number four on the demonic leaderboard, meaning that Jack has enough kills for a counter UAV. Casey calls someone up and requests their help in tracking down a certain demonologist, with him talking to the guy in a certain way that leads you to believe that he knows him quite well, while offering to pay double his usual rate, insinuating that Casey has a habit of tracking people down and should probably be put on a watch list or something similar. Casey, by this point, now believing that there's something seriously wrong with the Jack in the Box, decides to set his camera up to record it. But when Casey returns later on, the box isn't where he left it. Music begins to play from the box as if somebody is winding it, leading Casey in its direction. And after finding it, Casey is attacked by the creature and just left there to lie on the floor, because I guess he just doesn't like the taste of Americans or something. Too much salt. He takes his camera and attempts to tell Lisa about the whole seven foot murderous clown incident, but on account of the whole seven foot murderous clown incident sounding like complete bullshit, she thinks that he's just had one too many of those sleepless nights, especially as the footage he tries to show her conveniently blacks out before anything interesting can be shown, because I guess it's just too hard to go and take her to the box. The box that has already established that it's in the business of killing people. Casey ends up finding a piece of paper with the old owner of the Jack in the Box name and address, and he learns that the man was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. Well, that sucks. But I guess 12 years is enough time to be arrested, charged, and serve time for murder, because even though I'm not a professional when it comes to the world of incarceration, this looks suspiciously not like a prison to me, with that guy looking suspiciously not in prison. After talking to the man, we once again get another flashback sequence, because it would seem that this movie has no confidence in us actually watching it, followed by him then telling Casey that the best thing he could possibly do right now is to leave before he's blamed for the lives that have already been taken. A bunch of people go missing in the same place, where the new guy from out of town works who claims there's a supernatural seven foot tall demonic French clown gobbling people up. I'm sure they'll believe him just fine. He's about to actually take the man's advice and leave for good, but is talked out of it last moment by the hallucination of his dead fiance, leaving me to think that, uh, yeah, maybe he is actually just mad. He retrieves the box and takes it out to a field to burn it, but when he returns to the museum, he sees that the box has clearly taken an Uber, as it's sitting right there in front of him as the clown begins to emerge from it. Don't you think that it was awfully convenient for this French demon clown to wait until they're all the way back at the museum? You know, instead of when they were both alone in a small confined space, out in the middle of the pitch black British countryside to strike. How nice of him. But once again, all that the clown really seems interested in is knocking him to the ground, doing a little bit of a scream, and leaving him to take a beauty nap while lying in a puddle of his own blood. The next day, Casey gets fired from his job at the museum, because it would seem that running around playing Ghostbusters is nowhere near as viable of a career as Bill Murray made it look. But on the upside, he's finally given the address of the demonologist he was inquiring about earlier, who I totally definitely didn't forget about until right now. He goes to pay the man a visit, and despite being one of the only 
people in Britain who does this professionally, he doesn't really seem to care all that much about Casey's murderous clown predicament. You'd think that after dedicating your entire career to demons, you'd at least be slightly interested in an actual demon, unless this is just a normal occurrence for the man, and this is the fourth one he's dealt with this week so far. But he is kind enough to tell Casey that the demon won't kill him, as he's the one who released it, and the only way that he'll be able to stop it is if he stabs it in the heart, traps it in the box, and says the words, Bestia ad inferos, which doesn't sound very French to me. He might have a hard time understanding you. Meanwhile, his boss, well, ex-boss really, is pulled towards the box and sliced up by its spinning blades, because apparently this thing now has spinning blades. Lisa ends up coming across the remains of her boss, and by remains, I mean just a foot, because unlike most of the internet, Jack clearly hasn't got a thing for feet. The clown confronts Lisa and stabs her in the gut, but is distracted by Casey's arrival before he can finish the job. And for the third time in the movie, the clown violently knocks Casey to the ground, the uninfused demonologist did say he can't kill him, but nothing about concussing him until he turns into a vegetable. Fortunately, Casey's able to impale Jack with a fire poker, as he's just kind of standing around fondling Lisa's face instead of guaranteeing his next kill, which for some reason causes the demon to be sucked back into the box, which to me seems like a bit of a design flaw to be honest, considering the only way he can trap the demon is with him being in the box. The only problem being is that the demonologist said if any part of the demon is left behind in our world, then it will be able to return to finish what it started. And yep, that's definitely a snapped off claw right there. The police arrive at the scene of the crime and find Casey with a stabbed Lisa, which ends in him being placed under arrest. But due to the police's track record in this movie, he'll be out in a few weeks no doubt. With Casey now in police custody, Lisa decides to take the box back out into a field and bury it, because that method clearly worked so well the first time. But for some reason, buries it barely a foot beneath the ground, almost guaranteeing that I'd trip over it while taking my morning stroll if I took morning strolls. And that's where the movie comes to an end, with Casey in the interrogation room seeing an evidence picture showing that the claw was left behind, just as it cuts back to Lisa in the field, where the box with a light sprinkling of soil on top of it flies open and she's dragged inside. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why we always bury our demonic children's toys at least six feet below the ground. Before we wrap things up, I'd like to quickly shout out Morbid Minds, a clothing brand that me and my girlfriend have been working on for a while now, where we'll be open for pre-orders very soon. If you like the look of any of the designs you see on screen now, as part of our vintage horror collection, then make sure you click the description to see our Instagram and website, where you can guarantee yourself a pre-order once we're taking them. Don't forget about the usuals like my Instagram and Twitter to keep up to date with absolutely useless information, but at least you'll get updates on when future videos are coming out. And before this comes to an end, I'd like to quickly say thank you to my patrons. Thank you to Dom, Bort, Hunters263, Rebecca Pitts, Total Drama Rebooted, A Dandy in Space, Martin Brannan, Natasha Twyman, Rin and Whiskey, Jarrett CBs, Nicholas, Pascal Mathis, Fighting the Pirates, Taj Via Sandhu, Richard McGowan III, Eddie Shivink, Macy J, Reese Harford, Horatio, Jamie Thompson, Ramey Patterson, Chris, Michelle, Newcomb, Fabian, Dennis, Wade Knott, Ike, Mr. J2, Monopogy, and Ashley L. Wins. Thank you so much to my patrons, and thank you to everyone else for watching.